But a proposal is much less about us and really about the seller. So a proposal is presented. It's not just sent. A proposal is framed in light of the seller and our understanding of them and what's most important to them. The proposal is like saying, okay, seller, I've been talking to you and I've been listening. I've asked some questions. I think I understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Here's my best recommendation and proposal for how we get you from where you are to where you're trying to go with this property. So the one big thing becomes the lens through which we present that, right? If you're sitting down to talk to your seller and you know their one big thing is the care for the tenants, you're going to frame your whole conversation in light of that to make sure that they feel like that itch is getting scratched. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at RCB rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 388. Many of us have been in competitive buying situations with multiple offers on the table for that one special property. It's never fun to lose out to another buyer. And today's guest has figured out a way to bypass that process altogether. Jeff Stevens specializes in relationship-based negotiations, and he prefers to buy his properties off market and directly from sellers. Jeff believes you need to solve the person before you solve the deal. And today he's going to show us how that works. Jeff is also the founder of the Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneur and the host of the popular podcast, Racking Up Rentals. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. I really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started investing in real estate. My story probably started in a little bit of a similar way to a lot of people when I happened to pick up a a purple book that got my wheels turning in an exciting way. And I thought, huh, this sounds really, really, really interesting. And this was back in about probably 2003 or so. And so within a couple of years, I started being pretty proactive about trying to find a way to make that work. My wife and I had just bought our own primary residence. And so within several months, the property had appreciated on paper. And I thought, all right, I think we could probably get a HELOC on this house of ours and we could maybe use it to go buy a rental property. So that's what we did. My first deal was completely different than anything I would do today. And it's so funny. I always say if that exact same opportunity walked across my desk today, I I wouldn't do it, but I'm so glad that I did because it got me in the game, but it was a very conventional, a conventional loan, a conventionally sourced property. It was on the MLS. A single family rental. It was a little triplex about a mile from our house. And that was how things got started. But it was just a part-time thing for us for for several years. We had another business doing marketing and branding consulting. And so we would buy, you know, we'd make some money in our business. We'd pay down the HELOC, borrow against it and buy another rental property. And then we moved and kept our old house. So we kind of very slowly and organically built up, you know, like maybe six units or something like that. But after about 10 years of having my marketing and branding agency, I was starting to just get a little tired of it, honestly, a little bit bored and feeling like I needed a new challenge. And I thought, hmm, this real estate thing is sure, you know, it, it captured my attention and my excitement for many years now. And so in about 2013, and then I made the switch to doing what I do today full time. In making that switch and going full time, what direction did you decide to head? Because there's so many different avenues you can go down when you're doing doing real estate investing. How did you decide which which road to take? I would say that the process leading up to that, and then the, frankly, the first year or two of being full-time was a little bit like stumbling around in the forest, trying to find the right path. And so I, I had dabbled a little bit before that in learning a little bit about wholesaling, trying some things with that, that didn't feel like me. There was a lot about that actually that really, it didn't make me feel like myself, I should say. And then we did a flip and that went pretty well. Then we did another flip and that didn't go quite as well. And so we were kind of stumbling around. I knew I knew I wanted to ultimately have a rental portfolio and I had the seed of a rental portfolio already, but I didn't understand how I was going to be able to really take this idea and scale it without it being very, very slow and kind of tedious. 
And so ultimately then I was connected with a great mentor, Greg Pinio, who had been working with a lot of the, the people I was getting to know in my community and my peers in the real estate investing community in Portland, Oregon, where I was. And that's when everything kind of really came into focus and I had a clear lens. And then everything since then has been much more efficient and effective. Talk about that, finding that mentor who helped clarify things for you. And, and what was that process like? And what was at the end of that clarity? You know, it's really so funny that I think of that expression. I'm sure we've all heard that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And in this case, I think that's just unbelievably accurate to this situation too, because I had heard of Greg many times just, you know, and mentioned from different peers and whatnot, but I didn't feel like I was needing that, I guess, at that point. But a really interesting thing happened where I had had this one particular property in a contract myself with seller financing. And when we did our due diligence, we found it had some significant structural issues with the foundation. And even though we had this seller financing deal tied up, great relationship with the seller, I wasn't able to renegotiate it and create a deal structure that really worked. And we had to let it go. About four or five months later, I happened to be with some, some peers who were conducting like a Saturday bus tour of deals that they had done and kind of driving us around and showing us little mini case studies. And the last property that we pulled up to was this exact house. I mean, I, this is Portland, Oregon. It's a decent sized city. Of all the houses in Portland, we pull up to this exact house and I just could not believe it. And Mike, the person who was conducting the tour, starts explaining this really interesting and complex deal structure where he negotiated seller financing and then he was wrapping this note and reselling it to a house flipper and how he had gotten around all this stuff. And I honestly, I walked up to him afterwards and I said, Mike, I think I'm a pretty smart guy here, but I can barely follow what you just described. And he said, Jeff, look, if you want to be as good at this as I think you want to be, and I think you can be, you need to step up your education. And that's when I really decided that I, I ha finally had to meet this Greg person that uh, had been recommended to me. What did he do differently that you had failed to do in your negotiations? He had structured a similar acquisition with similar terms, I even believe, in a similar price point. But what I didn't understand that he understood was that there were certain things we could negotiate into our deal that would allow us to be creative with the collateral for, for the note. So I learned at that point of the concept of something I use today, like all the time, which is a substitution of security clause. If I buy a property with seller financing, oftentimes that property is the collateral for that seller financing loan at the beginning, but it doesn't have to stay that way forever. And so in this particular case, as I recall, this is many years ago now, but they they negotiated that. They they provided the seller with a different piece of collateral, and then were able to sell the property on terms themselves to a house flipper who wasn't afraid of the foundation problem. So they made some money on the arbitraging the price of the property that they had bought and now they're reselling. But they're then also making money on arbitraging the interest. So they borrowed money from the seller at a lower interest rate, let's say 3%, and they're probably charging you know 10% or 12% to this house flipper. And they had made this deal work through creative deal structure concepts that I just was not familiar with at the time. Tell us what your your niche is and and how you're you're investing in money. So I just want to make sure everyone is crystal clear on what your actual strategy is, Jeff. So I would say that my strategy is all about off market relationship based negotiation. So just directly with sellers, just sitting in a regular person's living room, working out a win win deal that in most cases for me involves seller financing, and even the term seller financing can be used, I guess, in a lot of different ways. And I think people talk about creative financing and seller financing. I think there's a lot under that overall umbrella. But what I'm talking about is actually very straightforward. Simply, I'm buying the property from the seller, the, the title's transferring to me, they're becoming the beneficiary of a promissory note. And they have a deed of trust that's recorded against that property in the county where it's located as a security instrument. So I'm not personally doing much in the way of subject to or wrapping existing mortgages or anything like that. Oftentimes the seller I'm buying the property from owns it free and clear, or if they don't, then my down payment will pay off their current loan. And I'm simply making payments to them. The sort of the technical name for this from a 
tax perspective would be an installment sale. High level stuff for a lot of our listeners and myself, I'll admit. But walk us through that. Walk us through an actual scenario from the from the moment where you sit down with the seller. And if I may, I'd love to even back up a little bit before the moment I sit down with the seller, because how I find myself in that living room is part of the story too. So I believe that I, you know, that expression start with the end in mind. Well, I know that I want to buy a property off market with seller financing. I know that that's the ultimate goal. And so I have to start lining up the previous dominoes that will lead to that outcome in a way that will facilitate that. So an off-market situation with seller financing is going to require some level of trust and comfort. It is also going to require a type of conversation where we can kind of unpack the appropriateness of the solution of seller financing for the seller's situation. I also know I don't want to, as you mentioned in the intro, I don't want to have competition. I don't want to be one of five people you know, submitting offers. I don't want to submit an offer at all. I want to present a proposal. And a proposal is entirely different than an offer. So as I work backwards all the way to the very beginning, the question we have to ask ourselves first is, who is a good candidate for seller financing? And then what's the best way to reach out to them? So the the best candidate for seller financing is a person who has a situation that would be well addressed by a seller financing sale. And this is one of the key points I hope that your listeners will take note of, maybe even write down, is that seller financing is much more about the seller than it is about the property. It's about them and their tax situation and their the role that they want real estate to play in their ability to have an income and yet their ability to have freedom to do other things. And so I'm looking for people who would have big capital gains tax bills if they were to sell their property, right? So I'm looking for a list of people who've owned an absentee property, like a rental property, right? They don't, if you live in a house, chances that your, your, you know, your, your capital gains tax bill is going to be really nasty are very, very low. So I'm looking for rental property owners who have owned a property for, it, let's say, at least 10 years. So if, if it's a person who's selling their personal residence, chances are when they sell, they're not really going to have to pay capital gains because they've lived in the, the property long enough. And the tax law allows them to take those gains tax-free if they've lived in a property, what, two of the past five years? I think two of the past five years, yeah. So even if there is a tax bill, it's not going to be that bad. Yeah. So you're looking for people who own a property that they're not living in, that they, when they sell it, they will have to pay those high capital gains. And just to bring it back around to where you were, this is solving the person before you solve the deal. Is that, is that the term you use? It is the term I use. Absolutely. And that process kind of begins at the very begin beginning as well as throughout all the conversations. And so, yeah, I, I like to say that we have to solve the person before we can solve the deal, which is simple when you say it, but it is also a little bit easier said than done because just as humans and probably as real estate investors, we're you know, pre-wired and really excited to just jump in and start looking at numbers and kind of coming up with a deal structure and tossing out ideas and seeing if we can get a yes really quickly. And actually kind of what we need to do is slow down and back up just a little bit to focus more on solving the person. Because if we jump into just solving the deal, we will never know I mean, we might come up with a deal structure that works, but we'll never know if it's as good as it could have been had we understood our audience better. When you're solving the person, I'm, I'm sure you've had hundreds, if not thousands of these conversations. What are like the top three or four things that need to be solved when you when you sit down with, with these sellers? So I like to say that every seller has probably a small handful of things that are considerations for them as they're evaluating possibly selling their property. But there's always one thing that's at the top of the list. So there's always one thing that matters more to them than anything else. And the corollary to that, kind of the flip side of that coin is not everything can matter to, to a seller as well. So we talk about, in my community, the like what is the seller's one big thing? What is that number one most important thing to them? That The itch that's such that if it doesn't get scratched, there's going to be no deal, right? So here, just give a couple examples. Sometimes it is a capital gains tax situation, as we discussed. You know, they might just say, "I there's no way I am paying the capital gains tax. I I couldn't afford it. I don't agree with it in principle. I don't like the administration the money's going to, whatever it might be. 
A completely different seller, though, their one big thing might be making sure that the tenants in their property are not displaced through the sale. You know, they've managed the property themselves. They have a, you know, grandparent-like relationship with them, and they just want to make sure that those people are not going to get displaced. That becomes the biggest thing for them. And any any number of things can be the one big thing, but every seller has got a one big thing, and I think that's what we have to crack the code on. Have you ever encountered one, one of those one big things where you just can't help them? I think a couple of things happen in that case. Sometimes the seller themselves is really not that clear on what their one big thing is, and they have to kind of go on their own little journey to figure out what's most important to them. And sometimes the questions that we ask them can help facilitate that, but they don't always know, or sometimes they'll have conflicting thoughts. And so they're, they might not be ready to sell at that point because they're not really sure what's kind of most important to them. Other times, one big thing certainly could just be something that's a little bit out of reach. You know, I mean, a, a dead simple example that we've all experienced is a seller being stuck on a certain price. And I like to say that a seller's never really stuck on a certain price. They're stuck on a, on what that price represents. You know, the seller says, I want $400,000. It's not because they want the ink in the paper that is $400,000 of cash to land on their dining room table. There's things that are underlie that, you know, that's like, I want to set the high watermark in my neighborhood. That's more of an emotional ego reason for why 400,000 makes sense to them. Or that guy, Bob down the street, who's always been my rival for the last 10 years, he just sold his for 385 and by golly, I'm getting 400, right? Or someone says, no, the, the motor home that I want is $400,000 and that's why I need to hit that number. So we, we need to sort of dig to find out why something like that matters to them. But sometimes the thing's just a little bit out of reach for us, but we'll never get anywhere really and know that we've crafted the best possible deal unless we uncover what that one big thing is. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. Once you do uncover that one big thing, how does that inform the conversation from there? And kind of take us through that conversation, please. Once we know what their one big thing is. And, and really there's, there's a lot of accessory, you know, insights that we have to, to understand about somebody too. I, I always say that there's information and there's insights, you know, information is the roof is 12 years old and we get $1,400 a month in rent, but insights are, I can't stand the idea of capital gains tax or the idea that my house might be torn down that's a rental now that, but I raise my kids and it breaks my heart. Like those are insights, right? So we have to have both information and insights. But once we understand someone's one big thing, it becomes the, the lens and the frame through which the rest of the conversation takes place and ultimately a proposal to them. You know, and I, I sort of teased a minute ago, the idea of, of a proposal being different than an offer. And the one big thing really informs that. So, you know, an offer, that's the like one of the most common words we have in our in our industry, right? An offer really is kind of about us. You know, it's like saying, here's what I'm willing to do. I will offer you this and you can say yes, you can say no, you can counter it. And an offer is often sent. It could be emailed. It's usually a long bit of paperwork, but a proposal is much less about us and really about the seller. So a proposal is presented. It's not just sent. 
a proposal is framed in light of the seller and our understanding of them and what's most important to them. The proposal is like saying, okay, seller, I've been talking to you and I've been listening. I've asked some questions. I think I understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Here's my best recommendation and proposal for how we get you from where you are to where you're trying to go with this property. So the one big thing becomes the lens through which we present that, right? If you're sitting down to talk to your seller and you know their one big thing is the care for the tenants, you're going to frame your whole conversation in light of that to make sure that they feel like that itch is getting scratched. And that's a huge difference, what you're describing. I, I, I just put the cherry on top of that. Why is that so important to, to make it more about the seller than, than about you and what you want to offer? First of all, I mean, one thing I was just thinking about yesterday is the principle that everybody likes their own ideas best. And when we make a proposal, you know, what we're really saying is, you know, you mentioned this thing and you mentioned those things. And I realized that what you're really thinking might be best for you in terms of selling this property is X, Y, Z. And so when we present it that way, they feel a sense of ownership of, of that idea. You know, it's not just us coming out with some random thing that we would like to see happen, but we're saying, you know, in light of what you've told me, it seems like maybe X, Y, Z would be the best way to approach this. But overall, I find that like, this isn't, this is not a volume game, right? This is not a send out 20 offers a week and throw things at the wall and see what sticks kind of a thing. This is a more investment of time and energy in each conversation, but a higher, a much higher likelihood of getting a yes from that seller because we are properly recommending something and proposing something that fits for them. One thing I was just thinking about this the other day is if you if you thought about like a doctor, you know, we have a diagnosis and we have prescription. A doctor never, ever, ever prescribes before they've diagnosed, right? But in real estate, that's what we do all the time. We're like, oh, we haven't even diagnosed anything at all. We're just going to go ahead and start telling you what we think should happen. And that just seems odd to people. You know, if you walked into your doctor's office and sat down and the doctor walked into the room and said, okay, I'd like to prescribe you this, this, and this. And you said, you didn't even ask me what my symptoms were for crying out loud. What? You'd start to get really concerned that like this doctor's got their own kind of an agenda. This is a very baseless prescription. Your guard would go up. And that's kind of what happens all the time in in real estate. But if we present it as, you know what, I've been listening to you. I've asked some questions. Here's what I think we're trying to accomplish. You tell me, did I get that right? Okay, good. Here's how I kind of think we should go about it. And ultimately, I propose that I buy your property at this price with this down payment, et cetera. And it feels tailored and appropriate to them. And like you were really listening and people like to feel heard. When you are talking to these sellers, I think you're finding these, these opportunities off market. So are these sellers that aren't talking to any other buyers and, and how are you accessing them? So our, it's so funny. Our approach, I would say, is extremely sophisticated and dead simple at the same time. So the, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, really the competition that I face all the time is the seller just continuing to do what they're doing now. Like, you know, the status quo is my competition, in other words, but almost never are they talking to another couple other buyers and then going to evaluate between them. It's really nobody else in, in the world really knows that this property is even potentially for sale. So what we do is as old school as this sounds, we send nice, simple, polite, low pressure letters to the people. Cause again, seller financing is more about the person than, than the property. So we look for properties in the area that we would want to buy, but then we're you know, we're crafting a list, we're querying the, the database of public records for more of like the person profile, right? Again, absentee owner, they've owned it for a while. It's in this area. So we send them a nice, polite, thoughtful letter. It doesn't, it says, if you picture like a normal we buy houses letter and then picture exactly the opposite, ours is exactly the opposite, right? We're not talking about closing fast. We're not talking about using cash. We're not talking about buying it as is or covering closing costs. We're just introducing ourselves and positioning ourselves as a peer. And I think that's very, very important because when someone perceives you as a peer, that conversation feels safe. It, it doesn't feel like, oh boy, they, they're the lion and they see me as a gazelle and they're trying to you know pounce on me because they see some vulnerability here, desperation or quote motivation or anything. 
You're just saying, hi, this is me. I saw you have this property. I'm a local landlord like you are. If you would ever consider selling that property, would you give me a call? It'd be nice to sit down and talk about it. I'm in no big hurry. Hold on to my letter. If the time isn't right right now, I hope to hear from you someday. It's kind of like that doctor example you just gave, prescribing uh, the solution before you know what the symptoms are. Though I get those letters all the time. Hey, I'll buy your house. I can close quick with cash, et cetera. And th that's proposing prescriptions without really knowing what my situation is. If I wanted to sell, do I really need to sell quickly? Uh, do I really need to, a buyer, a cash buyer? That, that may not be the case. So I like your approach in that you're, again, you're more about getting in sync with the seller and what their needs are. Absolutely. And you know what happens? The two things happen all the time. One is when a seller calls, like I experience this all the time. My students experience this all the time. A seller calls and says, you know what? I get letters like every week about my property. I've never called anybody back before, but yours felt different. And so they they say that because it just feels like it's coming from one real person to another, not a home buying service or a solutions provider or anything like that. Just like from one real person to another. So that's the first thing we experience all the time is people saying, I've never called anybody back despite getting hundreds, dozens of letters. And then the second thing is we'll get phone calls from people six, nine, 12 months later, two, three, four years later, because they got the letter and they thought, okay, this is a real person, but the time isn't right right now. And they just put it in a folder and that doesn't have like, no, you know, nobody really says, oh, look at this beautiful, glossy, postcard with the words as is, and it's bright yellow. That's really sweet. I think I'll put it in the folder. No, they're just like, nope, that's not for me right now. And they just throw it away. But the right letter from a real person that really positions it as just a safe conversation with peers will get saved absolutely until the right time. I'd imagine there's a handful of solutions you're usually employing. What are some of those top solutions in structuring these deals? You know, the thing that's so cool about seller financing is that everything is negotiable. It's hard to even say like, this is normal or this is standard. I like to give people the visual, like, you know, if you went into like a, an audio studio where your favorite band is recording their next album and you went into the, the mixing booth, you would see a, a dis display there with like a thousand knobs and buttons and things like that. And I think that seller financing is kind of like that. Every little term is like one of these little knobs and dials and buttons that can be just custom adjusted based on what works for the seller and what works for us. So I will tell you, I'll kind of give you some generalities, but what's really neat about it is it is that everyone is truly different. I would say in my own world, you know, we end up making a down payment. I, I'm not of the, hey, let's go buy property with zero down kind of like, a, to me, it always feels a little bit gimmicky. Sometimes we've had very small down payments. We've had larger down payments. But just as an average, let's say maybe I'm shooting for around a 10% kind of a down payment might be sort of typical. One of the myths of seller financing, and then there are quite a few, is that sellers are doing seller financing reluctantly. And thus, they feel like they have to have a lot of protection with a huge down payment. They have to have an onerous interest rate because they'd rather be doing something else. And this is a, their last resort. And there's a whole bunch of these sort of myths. So I find that when you're talking to the right person though, and you've unpacked the conversation correctly, seller financing feels like they're not doing it for you. They're doing it because it's the best solution for them. And a lot of these sellers who have this, for instance, capital gains tax situation, getting a big old down payment would not serve their needs well. It would kind of do the opposite. So let's say we end up with maybe about 10% down, the balance on a promissory note. I would say in the last, you know, whatever, 10 years, my average promissory note interest rate's been maybe four and a quarter, something like that. No, no correlation exactly with mortgage rates. Like nobody's sitting down and saying, well, you know, Wells Fargo's rates are this. And so we need to be there. It's just sort of what makes sense for everybody, what payment makes sense for the buyer, what receiving, what payment makes sense for the seller amortization, or is there any? A lot of the, the properties I buy, we actually negotiate interest only or more payments. So we have the ability to pay principal, but not the obligation. And that for me is due in large part to, I like to you know keep the bar of what I have to pay low, but I'm on the West Coast where cash flow is already tight anyway. And so that allows me to preserve the cash flow that I, that I can, you know, it could be a five, 10, 15, 30 year term. But Brian, the thing that I want to, to bring up, the couple of the more, more unique things I kind of alluded to earlier when I first discovered this approach really 
are what the elements of what I would call today supercharged seller financing. And what that means is there are certain things that we can negotiate into our deals, into our promissory notes that make the whole deal much, much, much better. So when we're buying a property with seller financing, we're really buying two things. We're buying the property and we are buying the financing. Now, in a normal situation, you know, a normal loan from, again, Wells Fargo or somebody like that, the property and the financing go together. There's something called the due on sale clause that you don't get to get rid of the property, but keep the financing. But when we're buying seller financing properties, we're actually negotiating two different really valuable things for ourselves. One is the property and the other one is the financing. And those might come together at the beginning. I mean, they do come together at the beginning, but do they have to stay attached and married forever? No, they don't. And so some of the elements of supercharged seller financing allow us to provide different collateral for a loan that we have negotiated with the seller. There's other things we can do, like take a bigger loan and break it into two or three smaller loans, for instance. And so what this does, and this is the, the key point that I realize this is not mainstream, what we're talking about right now. So this is going to take a second to soak in for everybody, and as it should. What that means is that we're out there intentionally trying to buy two great things, a property and a, and a package of financing. But in any given deal, one might be better than the other. And that means there are times all very frequently in my own world that I buy properties with seller financing that I don't even want because I actually do want the block of financing that I've negotiated. I might sell the property that secured that loan but keep the financing and provide a different piece of collateral for that financing. So here's just a simple example. And then I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this because I could go on for hours. This is really exciting. The more and more and more it sinks in. Let's say there's a, a house that's worth, you know, the retail value is $500,000. If I can buy it for $500,000, most investors would say, why would you do that? There's no margin there, you know, maybe there's some value add component, but most people don't get too excited about paying 500,000 for a $500,000 property as investors. But if I was able to only put say $50,000 down, I had $450,000 on a note at 2% interest with interest only payments for 30 years. When I look at the two things that I just bought, the property and the loan, the loan is way better than the property. I don't necessarily need to keep the property at all. I could sell the property and, but keep the loan in my portfolio because that, that was actually the more valuable thing that I bought. So there's kind of this whole art to learning what those flexibilities are that we could negotiate into our deal and then how we might actually use them. Once that stuff sinks in, it gets to be a really, really exciting game. So using that example, I can see how having a, a note for five hundred or $450,000 at 2% can be very valuable because you can go, if you can sell that house, take that profit and go deploy it somewhere else at, at a 2% interest rate, that's, that's pretty amazing. But what are you substituting that collateral with? Because if you sell the house, you no longer have the collateral. What are you using instead? So we're going to use a, just a different piece of real property as collateral. So that could be something that we already own. Like So in this case, maybe let's say I have a, a four-unit building that has more than $450,000 of equity in it and has cash flow that's big enough to support the payment from that $450,000 note. I could have the seller release their lien interest on the house and record it instead on the fourplex that I already own. So they're secured the whole time. It's just changing the property that secures the loan. That would leave my house free and clear, which then I could sell it and just receive the proceeds because there would be no debt to pay off. Similarly, you could sell the house at the same time you were buying another property and the deed of trust, the loan security could transfer from being the house you're buying, I'm sorry, the house you already own to the new one that you are actually buying as well. So I've done I've done both of those things. I would say of those two examples, I do the first one a lot more. I will take my seller financing loan and I will secure it. I will substitute the collateral for it, secure it with a property I already own in my portfolio, leaving this property free and clear. And then I'll just sell the property, but keep the debt. 
when you do that, that's not creating tax liability for the seller because they, they're still owed that balance on the note, right? Exactly. Exactly. Which is a huge reason for why it's in their best interest to do that. And the reason they're doing it is because they don't want to pay the capital gains. Their incentive is not to be paid off on that note, but to just keep collecting income. Precisely. I love this strategy. It makes a lot of sense. How much of that do you have to explain to the seller though? Because it's a complex strategy. And if, if you're telling the seller, hey, I'm going to buy your house you're going to give me a loan on it, but then I'm going to sell your house and I'm just going to keep that loan and go put it on something else. I'd imagine that that can create some confusion and can at times be difficult to convey to the seller. How do you do that? I want to answer that question very specifically, but I also want to zoom out on a bigger point that I think covers that question and a few other things. One of the most important aspects of this whole strategy is a very, very careful unpacking of the whole conversation with sellers. The number one thing that I see, and this is the broader point, the number one mistake that I see in real estate investors do in their pursuit of trying to like sincerely, genuinely trying to buy properties with seller financing is they come into the conversation and they might as well be wearing a t-shirt that says, I want to buy your property with seller financing for my own reasons. They make their own agenda just too obvious and too transparent, and they make it all about them. And what that means is that they don't have the opportunity to talk to the seller in a way such that when seller financing comes up, it's presented in service to what the seller is trying to accomplish. So the, the, you could be talking to the exact same seller, but if the conversation goes the first way, when you just come in guns a blazing, talking about how excited you are to make a seller financing offer, it's not going to go very well compared to when if you just wait and you facilitate the conversation and you get the seller to bring up the things that are important to them, such as maybe deferring capital gains and continuing to have income. Now we're making our seller financing proposal in a way that looks like it's all about them. So take that idea now and we fast forward in the conversation to this idea of substituting collateral. Again, if I come to a seller and I say, all right, well, I'm only willing to buy your property if I can have this you know, paragraph in our promissory note that says I can substitute collateral, that's going to make the seller go, oh, no, no, no. And are they saying no because they think it's bad? No, they're saying no because they don't understand what the heck you're talking about and how it serves them. So through this conversation, which again, it, it, there's an art to how we unpack these conversations, but when we're crafting the promissory note and we're presenting it to them, it's very important that we present these supercharged seller financing elements, such as the substitution of security provision, as tools that help them get more of what they want. So here, I'll give you the exact role play of how that conversation would go. I'm talking through the draft of the promissory note with the seller. Okay, seller, you know, here's the purchase price, here's our promissory note, uh, our in amount, our interest rate, all the things we've discussed. Now, Seller, I know how important it is to you to make sure that you are not paying your capital gains tax bill until you want to pay your capital gains tax bill. You've set this up very strategically from a financial planning perspective to know you're going to be getting your income for the next 10 years predictably. And then after that is when you've decided you want to pay your capital gains tax bill. One of the risks that could, that could come up is that if I need to sell or refinance this property, you could end up getting paid off much earlier than you expect. And that would be bad for you, right? That would screw up your whole plan. And we don't want to do that. So I don't know if that need's going to come up for me, but obviously if it does, I don't want to feel like I've pulled the rug out from under you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to add this provision into the note that allows me to give you another piece of excellent collateral that will keep your note in play for the whole time you're expecting it to be in place so that your whole financial plan is intact the whole time you think it's going to be intact. So see how that, that framing is not about me. It's about them and what they're trying to accomplish. And by the way, it's completely honest as well. I mean, that they would be hosed if three months after closing, I decided, oh, I'm just going to sell their property. And they're like, oh my God, I, you know, I just all, did all this elaborate tax planning and assumed I was going to be getting $1,400 a month for the next 10 years. You just really screwed me up. Once again, you've made it about the seller and their needs as opposed to your needs, which might be to sell the, the property and take a profit. 
Now you can just keep that note, keep their income coming in and defer their, their capital gains for however long they want. That is the first time I've heard that strategy. And that is fantastic and amazing. Thank you for sharing it with us. What's your favorite hack or app? I am very, very low tech, kind of on purpose, but increasingly on purpose all the time. So in my business, we use like zero of the, the apps people talk about these days and the list pulling and all this kind of stuff. My favorite hack as a result is to call in my state, we close deals at, uh, at close properties at, sorry, close transactions at title companies. I go to a title company who I work with all the time. And I say, Hey, you would like to see more deals closed at your office, right? Would you please, you know, you've got a customer service department. Would you please pull this list for me so that I can market to these people and close more transactions at your office. And they're more than happy to do that. So I haven't paid for a list in like a decade because there's just no need to. I can simply go to the people who have access to the information I want, who it's in their best interest to have me close more deals and simply ask for the list. And, you know, three hours later, I have a, a spreadsheet in my email and that's who we're marketing to. How would people find out more about you or get a hold of you? What we do here, what we've talked about, like this could have worked for our grandparents as well as it works today. And that's what I think is neat about it is like kind of a classic and timeless approach to things. It might not be normal now, but it's timeless nonetheless. Anyway, thank you for asking. My podcast, Racking Up Rentals, is a great resource for to, you know, hear me wax philosophical on all of these, all of these topics. It's probably three fourths me kind of teaching and then another 25% or so interview. So that's a really good resource as well. And we have actually recently, as of the last maybe four months, created a free seller financing 101 training program, video training program. So I found myself feeling like I'd love to have more like advanced conversations with people about these seller financing topics that I love to geek out on. And I think other people will as well. But we have to have a common language, a common framework, a common foundation in order to have those more advanced conversations. So we recently created this thing. If you just go to seller financing dash, 101. It's just a, a free, it's about three plus hours of uh, video training to that you'll get all the 101 and, and have a good framework that you can then start thinking about more advanced stuff with. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing this advanced concept that you shared with us today. I would put this on the level of the conversation I had with Eddie Speed about seller financing because he kind of blew my mind and you just blew my mind with this idea of substituting the collateralization when you're doing seller financing. What a great distinction you made between buying the property and buying the note, buying the paper, and being able to use each separately to make a profit. So thank you very much for coming on the show today and sharing that with us. It's, it's been a real eye-opener and a real pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group, and you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more more at greenpropertymgt.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.